The CIA and Defense Department are two of the U.S. government's largest agencies, which run both secret paramilitary and military operations all around the world. Amna has this conversation now with the author of a new memoir who has played key roles in both agencies. Since the 1980s, the United States has carried out a number of large-scale covert military operations aimed at the Soviet Union, Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, Iran and North Korea, just to name a few. A lot has been written about all of this, but now one man who played a key role in part of those operations has stepped out of the shadows to share his story in a new book called By All Means Available, Memoirs of a Life in Intelligence, Special Operations and Strategy. That author, Michael Vickers, joins me here now. Mike, good to see you. It's great to be with you, Amna. Thank you for being here. So it was in 1984 that you got your first permanent assignment at the CIA. You were chief strategist for the Afghanistan Covert Action Program that was arming the Mujahideen that were fighting the Soviets who'd invaded in 1979. You came in and you essentially changed the entire CIA program. Tell us about that. What did you do? Well, so the program had just received a very large increase in funding, quadrupling the budget. Uh, from uh, Congress, from particularly led by a Democratic congressman at the time, Charlie Wilson. The movie has been made uh, after that story, and his role. And uh, so I thought there were a lot of possibilities uh, with these greatly increased resources that CIA hadn't asked for, but were just uh, given to them. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe we could do more than just impose costs on the Soviets uh, for their occupation of mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Um, our analysts believe there's no way the resistance could win. You know, the Red Army hadn't been defeated. And so that's what I set about to do. And, you know, some months later, I came up with a plan uh, to do it that then got, got implemented. This was all about beating the Soviets, not it just became, leading it, It right? became actually our, our policy objective shifted um, about four months later when President Reagan signed a then top secret directive to beat the Soviets, to drive them out of Afghanistan by all means available, and hence that's where the title of the book comes. We now know, all these many years later, right, we know how that U.S. support for the Afghan Mujahideen at the time led to other consequences, to the empowerment of other Islamic extremists, contributed to the birth of al-Qaeda, who ultimately then, of course, attacked the U.S. on 9-11. You wrote about this, about that hindsight in the book. You say, we missed the strategic significance of the Afghan Arabs, the volunteers who would provide the foundation for al-Qaeda. We also did not anticipate how the defeat of one superpower would motivate al-Qaeda to want to wage a global war against the sole remaining superpower, or the U.S. If you, if you could go back and do something differently. Would you have changed how you run the program though all those years ago? No, I don't think I don't think you I would have harming some of the most extreme militants of the group, well, right? Well, the Afghan resistance was divided between, you know, more fundamentalist uh, groups, um, yeah. some of which were the favorite of the Pakistanis, and then more traditionalists, some royalists, some more secular. And um, some of the fundamentalist groups um, did make common cause with the Taliban after 1996 and then became, you know, we became their enemies and, and, and uh, they became ours. So I don't think, I don't think we would have done anything differently in terms of the Soviet war. You left the CIA after the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan. Many years later, you joined the George W. Bush administration working on special operations. And one of your main areas of focus there were, were drone strikes mm -hmm. uh, that were ramping up at the time. And there was a period of time in which I personally actually was on the ground, as I mentioned to you earlier, in the part of the world where the U.S. was dropping more drones than uh, drone strikes than anywhere else in the mm -hmm. Pakistan and Afghanistan border region. Mm -hmm. And I saw the buildup of anti-American sentiment at the time as a result of those strikes. Were those strikes worth it in the end? Yes, I think they really um, helped prevent another 9-11 attack. You know, after al-Qaeda resettled in the Afghanistan-Pakistan border region, um, the threat to the United States went way up. Mm -hmm. And so we had the transatlantic airline plot to blow up 10 airliners over the Atlantic, you know, a 9-11 scale attack that might have killed several thousand people in 2006. And so President Bush made the decision to uh, launch a new campaign in 2008 to really start using um, these these weapons, these uh, drone strikes uh, against Al-Qaeda and its um, safe haven providers in the border region. And President Obama sustained it. And within about uh, four years of that, uh, core Al-Qaeda's back was essentially broken in that region. Its ability to plot uh, more was uh, limited. Um, 
And from polling I remember at the time, the, clo the closer you were to uh, the militants, where you were being bullied by them or, or other things, the more the local populace uh, supported it. The further you were away, it looked like a violation of Pakistani sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So people in the so-called settled areas of Pakistan had much stronger feelings against these things than those right in the border region. Many of those strikes were carried out against people whom we did not know who they were. Their identities weren't known until after they were killed in some cases, right? The signature strikes in which people were being targeted simply based on, on signature behavioral aspects or location. And we also know a number of civilians were killed along the way, too. There were mistakes. Women and children killed. A U.S. citizen, Warren Weinstein, who was held hostage in the area, was yeah. killed. Do we yet know the full cost in terms of civilians and people who shouldn't have been killed as a result of U.S. actions? Well, I think we have a pretty good idea. I mean, one of the decisions President Obama made um, late in his administration was to release the, the best data that we had in the U.S. intelligence about the number of non-combatant or civilian casualties. But that number was pretty small. It was in the 60 to 100. You're saying um, 60 to 100 civilians killed? Yeah, out of about uh, 3,000 um, combatants. Um, so the Bureau of Investigative Journalism that tracks this says the, the civilian casualties could be upwards of 1,700 people. Yeah, I don't think that's right. And I don't think the U.S. government uh, believes that either. You mentioned another major uh, operation you were a part of, which was the U.S. operation to kill Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm in Optabad, Pakistan, in 2011. And th that option, that nighttime special forces raid, was really the most risky of all the options on the table at the time, is my understanding. You were in meetings with President Obama and the CIA head, the secretaries of defense and state. How was that option chosen? So the options uh, operationally range from airstrikes, big bomber strike, to a small drone strike, and then various kinds of raids. And some were rejected, like a big bomber strike uh, would have caused collateral damage. You know, not only would have killed women and children in the house with Osama bin Laden, but neighbors as well. And so that one got rejected pretty quickly. A small drone strike option didn't have much reliability to it. It would only work when bin Laden was walking around for exercise. And a very small bomb might, not, might have missed, might have injured him, and then he would have fled. So President Obama settled on the SEAL raid that we ended up, one version of a special operations raid, but the one we ended up conducting. And that was the best option. It, it had its risky elements, but we tried to reduce the risk as much as we could by adding additional helicopters, reinforcing forces, et cetera, um, to make sure the force could get in and out. So with the special operations raid, if we got him and got his DNA, we would be able to convincingly tell the world. If we had done an airstrike, we wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. The book is by all means available. Memoirs of a Life in Intelligence, Special Operations, and Strategy. Michael Vickers, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you.